This is Evan Robb for Disrupt Ed TV. I'm excited today because today I am joined by Lee Watanabe Crockett, and Lee joins us today from Japan. Welcome, Lee. Hi, thank you. Absolutely, really excited that you're with us on Disrupt Ed TV today. Before we begin our conversation today, I'd like to tell our viewing audience a little bit about you. Um, you have a very interesting background. Lee works with governments, educational systems, and international agencies around the world to connect to their highest purpose and realize their wishes for the future. Lee also has several websites that he is connected with, Glo globaldigitalcitizens.org, and a wonderful blog called the Wabasabi blog, which I encourage all of our viewers to check out. A lot of great information from Lee Crockett available on that blog. Lee has written many books, and I'll highlight just a couple of them. Growing Global Digital Citizens, Literacy is Not Enough, Living on the Future Edge, and Understanding the Digital Generation. And his newest book is called Future Focused Learning. And Lee, I'd like to thank you for giving me an advanced copy of that book. I had an opportunity to read that book earlier in the summer and provide a review for you. And it is a fantastic book, and I encourage all of our viewing audience to check that book out as soon as it is available. And Lee, can I ask you when that will be available in America? Yeah, July 27th, uh, Solution Tree launches that. Okay, so that's right around the corner. Lee, for Disrupt Ed TV, what we're doing today is we're talking about change and positive change in education. And I know that you have uh, worked with school districts all across the world. You have a really unique view to share with our audience here today. And I wanna talk a little bit about solution fluency. That is uh, something that you are credited with creating and how that can apply to things that we do in America and all over the country, particularly the area of project-based learning and performance-based assessments. Yeah, it's, you know, when I first developed solution fluency, uh, when the fluencies in general, and that's uh, over a decade ago, that was really in response to looking at the skills that we're trying to cultivate in learners around the world. And it doesn't matter uh, which curricula we're looking at, uh, it doesn't matter which country, pretty much everyone has that same list of, we want kids to be critical thinkers and problem solvers and creative and, and so forth. Uh, but we say these things without any means to do them, just as nice ideas. And to me, if, if they're the essential things that, uh, that our learners need to be successful in their life beyond school, then we need to have that capacity and have a way to do that. And so that became structured processes. So for problem solving, you have solution fluency. For analytical thinking, information fluency. And what they become is a common language between uh, faculty and learners around what these things look like. Uh, and in, in many ways, they're the missing piece for STEM and PBL and future-focused pedagogies. Mm -hmm. uh, because what happens uh, when we look at these approaches is we move from teacher-centered learning, uh, which uh, I'll say, and it maybe makes people uncomfortable, but it's not a pedagogy. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an absolutely essential tool in your pedagogy, but it is not by itself a pedagogy. So how do we move from that typical, uh, that typical style of teaching to learner-centered learning? So we look at pedagogies like PBL and STEM and so forth, and, and our application of that becomes more teacher work. So the teacher builds the unit of of STEM or PBL, the, the teacher guides the students through the thinking. So the teacher's doing even more work, and my whole goal is to have teachers work a whole lot less. And you so know, solution of, fluency becomes the way to do that. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, you know, I heard in a, in a recent talk that you gave is this concept of encouraging educators to be able to step aside and realizing, and you conveyed this very well, that that can be challenging, especially if someone wants to feel in a lot of control in, in all of the elements that are happening within the classroom. Um, but you do encourage people, uh, teachers, to step aside. Um, and maybe you can share a little bit uh, with our viewing audience about how that can increase the learning for students. Well, there's a, there's a couple of really important things to understand. The first is that um, context and relevance to, to the learning is the, is the absolute most essential thing that we do. Um, we don't pay enough attention to it, and it's neurobiologically impossible to think deeply about things that you're not connected to. Mm -hmm. um, we, we need to create that relevance and that connection for the learners in order for them to do the learning. So we can't learn for them. All we can do is present information in a compelling way, uh, give them access to that information or access to those skills. But we can't do the learning, which means that they have to be doing the work. And in order to do that, that means we have to have the courage to step aside and allow the learners to be responsible for their learning because, after all, it's their learning. Mm -hmm. And we require functional independent learners. Uh, so it's, 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 an, it's an essential thing. We struggle with how to do it because of accountability and because of so many other things. But 
in my experience, when we find the courage to step aside and to challenge learners, um, we get some amazing things happening in the classroom. You know, you, you made a comment in one speech that I heard you give about, and, and I think what it was, was give them the problems, meaning students that matter, but that matter to them. And, and that can be challenging because sometimes, you know, when I've experienced this, you know, when I was a student, uh, that I would partake in projects that were clearly very meaningful and, uh, and important to, to the teacher. It resonated with them, but it, it, it didn't matter to me. Um, and uh, that requires some different kind of thinking. One of the things that I also saw you share in a speech was you talked about a group of kids that had worked to try to reduce homelessness and, and, and they created mattresses that they worked and, and, and they put together. And uh, maybe you can share a little bit about that. That was a really powerful story. Yeah, gosh, you know, there's, uh, the thing is that that's every day for me um, that I, that I experienced that. There's dozens and dozens of case studies on, my, on the wabisabilearning.com uh, wabi site mm -hmm. that are very, very detailed exemplars of exactly what you're talking about there, where we looked at what was a problem that matters to the learners, and then how would you go about actually solving that, and the, what, what would you do that would contribute to a solution for it? And these mm -hmm. particular, those particular learners are in uh, Vancouver, in British Columbia, mm -hmm. in Canada. And, um, and what they did was they collected um, single-use shopping bags from the, uh, from, uh, the dump, essentially. Uh, washed them and cut them and assembled them into, uh, crocheted them into sleeping mattresses. It's, it's quite amazing. They've recovered over 5,000 bags. Um, we, you know, the thing is that there's also a lot of curriculum that happened in there, which is the important part for the, for the teachers. There's a lot of writing. There's a lot of research. There's a lot of presentation. There's a lot of deep, deep work that happened there. Mm -hmm. And Evan, the way that we get there, um, you know, is to, is to ask our learners what matters to them. And one of the exercises I go through with all of uh, all of the schools I work with is uh, to sit down with, with learners and, and break out their thinking into three areas. I, so these are my three C's. And the first is, uh, what are you curious about? Mm -hmm. um, the second is, what are you concerned about? And the third is, what do you want to create in the world? And so, you know, we look at things then that uh, cause them uh, tension and apprehension, the things that they wonder about, and then what they actually want to do in the world. And that becomes the fodder for every bit of STEM or PBL or inquiry-based learning. I, I just call it future-focused learning. Mm -hmm. um, what it, it becomes the scenarios. It becomes that question about what is it that matters to the learners. And from there, you can get that deep connection. It's really, really powerful. And I know that our listeners can learn more by going to the Wabasabi blog. There are many articles on there uh, where you travel, obviously, into a lot more depth that we can cover on our show today uh, to help people understand how to do this. One of the things that you talk about is um, how do you take your first step? And I know that you have a term for that that I'll let you share with us. And possibly you can share some thoughts on on, on how one could take a first step. What would a first step be to doing things a little differently when it comes to performance-based assessment and project-based learning? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really great question. And that, and that work, which is the work in the Future Focused Learning book, mm -hmm. came specifically from my work with schools around the world for the last decade, 120 or 130,000 teachers now. And looking at what was it that, was able, that I was able to do to move them from what they were doing to a future-focused pedagogy. How did we get there? Uh, and we didn't get there by throwing out everything they were doing. Because uh, you know, one of the challenges that I have is that I listen to the rhetoric of, of my, fellow, um, uh, you know, my fellow presenters. And uh, gosh, it's not a lot of good talk about education. And I, I, the thing is that I, I want us to understand that we are doing great work. Uh, every person who is in education is doing great work. So it's not about how do we make bad work good. Uh, we're doing great work. The question is how do we make great work exceptional and how do we make exceptional work transformational? Absolutely. And that only happens by constant improvement. And so constant improvement means being curious about your practice and understanding that no one's pedagogy is beyond reproach. So what's one thing I could do today without throwing out everything and starting again? We don't need to build a multi-million dollar STEM facility and start again. We just need to connect to learners and make them responsible for their learning. So a simple shift of practice, and there's 10 of them in, in that book. And then a micro shift, which is a little incremental thing that you could do right away that would, that would move you towards that. And it's, they sound like oversimplifications, but they're incredibly powerful. So for example, uh, if we wanted to work with essential questions, one of the first things that we could do is don't start a lesson that doesn't have a question. Mm -hmm. If the learning is the answer, what was the question? 
And the question shouldn't be at the bottom of blooms, meaning it shouldn't be a who, what, where, when question. It should be a why and how question. So if we're going to talk about the Declaration of Independence, we could say, you know, where was the Declaration of Independence signed? That's not very interesting or very relevant or very deep for the learners. And if they respond with at the bottom, that's a completely acceptable answer to that question, really. Um, that's where it was signed. It was signed at the bottom. But if, if instead we move that question to, in today's global context and global economy, does, how does relevance remain for the Declaration of Independence? If we start with a question of that depth, yeah. and we're asking them to think and to reflect critically, in other words, evaluate, uh, not have an answer. There is no answer to that question. There's just opinion based on research. Now we've got a provocation for learning. So simply by asking more questions than we answer, um, and typically not answering questions, that's a simple shift of practice, and anyone can do that regardless of what their lesson plan is for today. Thank, thanks a lot, Lee. You know, one of the things, and you know, you said it very well, which is, um, and one of the things I really appreciate about your work is it's not born out of being critical of, about anything that we've done, um, but it is about finding a way to positively move forward and continue to grow and continue to, to transform learning um, for teachers and, and students all, all across the globe. It's a really powerful message. I would like to encourage our viewing audience to check out the Wabasabi vlog where there is a lot of information that Lee shares that you can read. Also, you can follow Lee on Twitter at Lee Crockett. And I strongly encourage our viewing audience to check out a copy of Future Focus Learning where Lee goes into a lot more detail on how you can make some micro shifts and positively impact teaching and learning in your school. Lee, I'd like to thank you for joining me today for our conversation with Disrupt Ed TV. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Absolutely. This is Evan Robb for Disrupt Ed TV, reminding you that if you want to bring creativity and innovation into your life, at times you need to disrupt your routine.